I have been with Columbus Public Health for a month shy of nine years. It's a great fit for me. I love serving the vulnerable populations and the underserved. As we enter the building, everybody will get hands I am a 26 year teacher here in Columbus Public Schools. I teach eighth grade, language arts and social studies. I'm a serial entrepreneur, <laughs> as, as I've been called, but our newest baby is the Blue Note Jazz Cafe. Futurity was started in 2014 here in Columbus, Ohio, and we really help organizations do two things. First, we help them analyze and visualize their data, and then from there, we use that data to help them communicate with their audiences in a one-on-one, -on -one, highly impactful manner. I've been working 15 years already, child care home provider in the Alper My Center, because that's what I like to do. I like to teach. We have like 30 kids that we serve in the center right now. So the Refuge is a 13-month peer support recovery ministry, which means that our, that our folks live with us. Anything and everything that causes an issue with somebody, we address in some way, because we see this time as not just addressing someone's substance abuse issue, but it's the underlying issue that drove them to drugs. You know, we had a couple soft openings at the end of 2019, but we, we were ready to go full throttle. Uh, January 2020, place was packed. We would turn people away because we couldn't fit them in here. And then March, COVID hit. This disease has a high mortality rate. It is highly, highly contagious. Like a lot of small businesses on March 13th, our world kind of came crashing to an end. Everybody was scared. I have my own personal reasons for being scared, but then professionally scared for our community. We had to change how we do everything without changing what we do. When they shut down schools, I said, this is serious. The shutdowns are happening. Our clients are, are calling us in a panic. We went, I think, about, about 21 days without getting a, a physical check. When they sent me the grant, the city of Columbus helped me a lot. My employer, they need to, you know, get paid. They gotta pay the house, the rent, they gotta buy food. And what I did, I used that money for my employer and plus more things to clean. The city of Columbus was sending emails out to us saying, here's a plan, here are resources for small business. We work with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. They contacted us early on in the pandemic letting us know about the PPP program. That allowed us to maintain our full staff, we maintained all our benefits, maintained all their salaries, and it really prevented us from having to make some pretty hard decisions here. Because of that support, not only did we uh, weather the storm and not do layoffs, we ended up hiring, growing, and came into 2021 stronger than ever. We have two sons that are 18 and 20 that, that were you know, assisted in the business. We had moved my parents in, as, as well as my, my younger sister who had cancer, into our home. And then when the COVID hit, uh, first my, my younger sister, she got it. And then like a couple of days later, you know, we were like, we better all get tested. So the whole family tested positive. Unfortunately, my sister, who was 44 at the time, passed away. We have a very close family. Um, and so, you know, to, to try to handle that and then separate that and come in here, put on a happy face and figure out how we're gonna keep the business afloat has been a challenge. March, April, and May of 2020 were incredibly difficult for us as an organization, just thinking through and asking questions and making sure we planned well so we could continue doing our mission. Columbus Public Health was a huge help in giving us guidance in what is a good way to keep our people safe. We're a congregate living setting, so we're around each other all the time and it's figuring out how do we operate like a massive family. People were gonna die because of COVID because COVID made people feel like they had to isolate. And in addiction, isolation is how people die. It is important to remember that we are in the midst of a global pandemic and COVID-19 has resulted in a public health crisis that has disproportionately negatively impacted minorities and people in communities of color. Racism being a public health crisis, for me, it's about time. We've been talking about health inequities, health disparities, social determinants of health for years and years and years and yet we continue to see these disparities in infant mortality, in HIV, in infectious disease, in heart disease. Protesters are back in downtown Columbus for the third straight day. Just thinking about how the, the protests, you know, unfolded, the, the unrest, people are finally, you know, getting fed up. We literally would saw them marching down Main Street, so we stood outside of our 
business. It's, it's given us a, a broad opportunity to, you know, discuss how we feel about it, what the outcomes are, and how it impacts, you know, because we didn't have to board up our business, fortunately. I am the mother of uh, two brown children. I've adopted two of my, my boys. They're both brown. So personally, it was something to go through as a parent. You know, I'm very proud of my multiracial family. So those things are, are really real for us. One of the things that has given me such great hope is the resiliency of the people around me that I work with. I think we're already seeing Columbus start to have this comeback. We're seeing the vaccinations you know, rolling out in, a, in a, an efficient way. I mean, you can see it behind me. They're out here vaccinating mass amounts of people every single day. We are going to be out of this someday. It, it forced us to, to walk with a certain level of nervousness, but hopefully people will come back together and appreciate life. I think that we learn life, love each other. Don't take life for granted. I think this is an opportunity and it should be a challenge, it should be difficult. There is such an excellent amount of loving, caring, kind people in this city that are incredibly smart. Columbus should be the example for the rest of the Midwest on what a city should look like. The space is here for us to have an incredible, incredible city and ask what do we want Columbus to look like in 10 years, not next year, in 10 years, and then make those choices. I think Columbus citizens are resilient, we're tough, we're, we have a lot of heart. It's that Midwestern work ethic that you hear so much about. It's the Columbus way, the idea that we're all supporting each other. I'm excited to see what's next post-pandemic. You know, we, we're gonna keep on fighting. What a year, but we're still standing. Tonight, we're together, albeit virtually, physically and emotionally exhausted, but filled with hope because we have weathered one of the most challenging years in our cities, our nation's history. We're still standing strong together. And as our neighbors in the video just showed us, not only are we still standing, we're moving forward. Each and every one of us have been impacted by the events of the last 12 plus months. We're still working to get to the other side of the pandemic, grappling with the need to reform police and end systemic racism. Columbus and cities across the country are seeing an unprecedented spike in violent crime. At the same time, there is great hope and tremendous opportunity to right the wrongs of the past and to build back stronger. We're on the path to a comeback, Columbus, an equitable, full throttle, better than we've ever been comeback. Because we don't want to just return to the way it used to be, to the status quo. We want to address the disparities the pandemic laid bare. We want to build a more inclusive, equitable city where all residents feel safe, and empowered to achieve free of prejudice and regardless of their zip code. Tonight, we will talk about recovering and rebuilding from all that we've been through, about creating resiliency to weather the next crisis, and about charting a unified path forward. Because at this moment, we're still a divided city, a divided country. And to be the best we can be, we need to move together toward dynamic, inclusive growth and shared prosperity for everyone who calls Columbus home. From the earliest days in the pandemic, we invested in our residents. In addition to providing rental assistance, food and small business relief, we also purchased enough Chromebooks so every Columbus City School student had their own device. We partnered with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission to provide internet hotspots and we invested $1.6 million to support learning extension centers to provide a safe, healthy environment for students to get help with school. Columbus Public Health, our warriors in this battle, set up and operated a hotline to provide potentially life-saving information to residents with COVID-related questions, answering thousands of calls. They constructed testing sites at the state fairgrounds that are now being used to administer vaccines. With the vaccines in our hands, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I need you to be that light. The safest, healthiest way for us to fully reopen is for everyone 
to get vaccinated. Please get your vaccine if you haven't already. COVID-19 didn't create the disparities in our community, but it's shown a bright light on those that already existed. It has made our mission to advance the equity agenda all the more important and the need to act so much more urgent. Nowhere has that been more apparent than with crime, especially those crimes involving our youth, both as victims and assailants. Our first step toward recovery must be to stop the violence in our neighborhoods. Columbus is not the only city that saw a spike in crime, and we know the cause is tied to the pandemic. So many families were left dealing with unemployment, housing and food insecurity, access to virtual classrooms, and so much more. The city invested $2 million of CARES Act dollars from the U.S. Treasury for anti-violence efforts in our neighborhoods. We worked with trusted partners, including the Shalom Zone, Community Development for All People, New Salem Community Development of Caring Foundation, and the Afrocentric Personal Development Shop that then supported grassroots organizations with micro-intervention grants as a violence prevention strategy for young people and their families. I started this year talking with small groups of community members, faith leaders, high school students, and law enforcement, listening to their ideas on how we can make our neighborhoods safe. From those conversations came investments in new initiatives to fight the continued violence, including growing up, that has already started the recruitment of young men. End the violence, a new approach to violence reduction from those who have lived it. I've called on suburban mayors and city managers to work with juvenile judges and find diversion programs that work for our youth. That call to action has already yielded positive conversations. And tonight, I'm announcing a $500,000 commitment to these diversion programs and asking our suburban partners to contribute to this important work. We've also expanded programs with proven track records, including Reroute. We're expanding this pilot program citywide, Safe Streets. We're expanding it to include first shift and to run from spring through fall instead of just summer. You can expect to see bicycle patrol officers in the Hilltop, Linden, and Southside later this month. We're also expanding safe neighborhoods to engage violent offenders with an alternative plan away from crime and violence. Our expansion will leverage the individual model into a group model and will be housed at churches in different neighborhoods. These are just the latest steps in fighting the crime we're experiencing today. With additional funds received from President Biden's American Rescue Plan, we will again reach out to our trusted partners with empowerment grants and continue to fight crime in our city. And I'm calling the federal and state government to finally enact common sense gun laws, universal background checks, because firearms are responsible for the vast majority of violent crimes, not just in Atlanta or Boulder, but right here in our neighborhoods. Reducing crime is just one example of the long road we have in rebuilding our community and doing so equitably. All of our young people suffered greatly from this pandemic. Few may have been infected, but all have been affected. As parents lost jobs and sometimes housing, as family members became sick, as schools moved to remote instruction, leaving our most at risk behind and as virtually all opportunities for social interaction and recreation were halted. Last summer, we invested CARES Act dollars to ensure Columbus Recreation and Parks could provide summer camps while still complying with safety regulations. We also invested $2 million for 40 nonprofit agencies to be able to expand their own planned summer youth activities and to do so safely but it was still just a shell of what we can offer in a normal year. Tonight, I'm announcing that we will be making unprecedented investments in our youth starting this summer to help our young people gain back some of what they lost. Recreation and Parks will also host a pilot project called the Park Pop-Up Performances Program. Think of it as a small-scale mobile arts festival 
Throughout the summer, the park pop-up program will provide paid performance opportunities for more than 200 local artists and offer accessible arts enrichment opportunities for the community. And again, we will offer financial support to other partner agencies to expand their summer recreational services. Summer employment goes a long way in building soft skills and confidence in our young people, while also putting cash in their pockets. This summer, Recreation and Parks will hire not only 125 seasonal staff, but 112 youth ages 14 to 23 for an eight-week paid leadership training and job readiness course. The Departments of Public Service and Neighborhoods are working to provide paid summer positions for young people to help keep our city clean. I'm calling on other employers who can engage youth to reach out to the Workforce Development Board. The city can provide grants. You just need to provide work and mentoring that our young people so desperately need. Let me ask you this. What are you willing to do to invest in our young people this summer? Recovery and rebuilding means investing in the next generation now. Children develop most in the first three years of life, everything from motor skills and language to the ability to socialize. Those without stable housing, food, and a nurturing environment will face developmental barriers that sometimes last a lifetime. Celebrate One continues to work to assure that every baby in Franklin County has the opportunity to reach his or her first birthday and beyond. While we celebrate a decrease of 29% in infant mortality, the infant mortality of black and brown babies remains persistent. In the next phase of our work, our goal will be an additional 28% decrease in infant mortality while being laser focused on minority babies. Specifically, we're working with the Ohio Better Birth Outcomes Collaborative on the next 10 years of this initiative. In my last State of the City address, I laid out an equity agenda that calls out racism and discrimination where it exists and guides our work to identify community-based strategies to address it. Reducing infant mortality and cutting the racial disparity of infant deaths, that is part of our equity agenda. High quality early childhood education is crucial in preparing children for kindergarten because studies show that kids who start school prepared are much more likely to succeed in school and in life. Late last year, we broke ground on the Hilltop Early Learning Center. It represents a $20 million investment from the city. In addition, money is being raised from the private sector for the center by Doug Bohr, whose family has long ties to the Hilltop. When completed, it will be a state-of-the-art facility with 12 classrooms, a full medical suite run by Nationwide Children's Hospital, a kitchen, both indoor and outdoor playgrounds, and a range of wraparound services to assure we meet the needs of every child. But our focus is not just on the hilltop. We wanna be a national leader in kindergarten readiness by 2030. Our public-private partnership, Future Ready Columbus, has developed and is seeking public input on the Future Ready by Five, birth to five plan for all of Franklin County. The blueprint to kindergarten readiness will harness the collective impact of our entire community to make the most effective investments for all of our children so that no child is left behind when they start kindergarten. Ensuring access to high quality early education, regardless of zip code, so that our children are prepared to thrive in kindergarten and in life that is part of our equity agenda. Rebuilding efforts for Columbus start in our neighborhoods. Despite the pandemic, we were able to continue with our neighborhood redevelopment efforts. We opened two new community centers, Scioto Southland on the south side and the Linden Community Center, a total of $35 million in capital investments. Both will be neighborhood hubs for multi-generational activities. In Linden, as part of the One Linden Plan, we not only opened the community center ahead of schedule, we also opened a new fire station, started building Linden Fresh Market to provide fresh food and prescriptions to the community. We began design work to completely reconstruct Hudson Avenue. In the Hilltop, as part of the envisioning Hilltop plan, we not only broke ground on the Hilltop Early Learning Center, we also began 
$10 million in streetscape improvements along Sullivan Avenue with improved street lighting and public engagement on public art coming this year. We saw our investment in Sanctuary Night, a space to help women in human trafficking pay off by providing food, clothes, basic hygiene, along with referrals and transportation to addiction treatment centers for over 170 women. The center is scheduled to be open seven nights a week, starting in July. And this year's capital budget will include $5 million for land acquisition and design of a new Hilltop Police substation. But it's important to remember that we are not exclusively focused on only Hilltop and Linden. Every neighborhood is unique with its own needs, and each deserves safe streets and sidewalks, clean drinking water, and opportunities for recreation. We will continue to make these investments throughout the city, from the far east to the south side to the northwest. One of our critical challenges in rebuilding our city lies in housing, particularly affordable housing. Even before the pandemic, 54,000 residents in Franklin County were spending more than 50% on housing. Columbus doesn't currently have enough housing at any price point, and it will not be able to handle the anticipated growth of our city if we don't make changes now. Tonight, I'm setting a goal for our city. We will cut the number of people paying 50% or more for housing by half by 2030. Or put another way, at least 27,000 of our neighbors will be safer and financially stronger without an undue burden for housing as we head into the next decade. It's a bold goal, but completely attainable through local policy, state advocacy, and increased pay for our residents. Together, through public-private partnerships and an all-hands-on-deck approach, we can begin to fix the housing crisis now. Plus, we're wrapping up our national search to fill a new housing director position, someone who will wake up every day thinking about how to solve housing needs in Columbus. I look forward to announcing our selection soon. The economic challenge and uncertainty brought on by the pandemic has hit our city's renters, many of whom who live paycheck to paycheck, particularly hard. The burden on residents to pay upfront cash security deposits is one we can alleviate with common sense legislation. I will be sending city council an ordinance to ensure that every Columbus renter has the choice to use a security deposit insurance program that would cost them just a few dollars a month. Over $480 million currently sits in security deposit escrow accounts just in our city. And we need that money in the pockets of Columbus families now more than ever. We know that creating mixed income neighborhoods is the best way for vibrant communities to thrive throughout the city. Right now, we're governed by zoning codes developed in the 1950s. We're not the same city we were then, and we won't be the same city in 30 years when the region is expected to see an influx of one million more residents. Our zoning codes must change to support the needs of a growing city, and they are. The Building and Zoning Department is undertaking a massive overhaul of our codes, starting with community engagement. It will be a long process, but the results will be transformational, laying the foundation to create more mixed income neighborhoods, like Wyland Park, without the need for variances on every single project. Transportation is the great equalizer of the 21st century and also plays a key role in developing mixed income neighborhoods. Columbus is currently developing Link Us, a network of corridors that will include high capacity and advanced rapid transit, bikeways, roadways, pedestrian improvements and development, all of which will connect neighborhoods to job centers. Increasing the availability of affordable housing and dynamic inclusive growth that is part of our equity agenda. The pandemic isn't over, but we are well into recovery and rebuilding efforts. The next big question is how will we build resiliency into our civic infrastructure so we're all prepared for the next big challenge we face? And how can we build equity into every step? First, we're making changes in sustainability. 
We know that climate change is a social justice issue because of the impacts on neighborhoods that have faced socioeconomic challenges. Despite the pandemic, we made sustainability advancements. We adopted the first ever energy benchmarking ordinance in the state of Ohio, foundational to our energy efficiency work. We conducted 30,000 home energy audits within the city with an emphasis on our opportunity neighborhoods. In the coming weeks, we will put together next steps for homes that participated so residents can see changes to their energy and water consumption and lower bills. In the November election, voters overwhelmingly approved a ballot issue to implement community choice aggregation and bring 100% clean energy to Columbus residents and small businesses by 2022. After multiple public hearings and public advisory group meetings, the program is set to begin in June. The Ohio-based clean energy program will drastically reduce emissions, providing the equivalent of removing over 300,000 cars from our roads and the same benefits of nearly 1.8 million acres of forests. Speaking of forests, our Recreation and Parks Department has completed the public input phase on an urban forestry master plan. It is in the process of updating the city's parkland dedication ordinance. Critical work in reducing the temperature of our city, especially in our opportunity neighborhoods. This year we'll finalize our community-wide climate action plan that will be our roadmap to reaching our 2050 carbon neutrality goal ensuring we do our part to limit global temperature rise and create a healthy, thriving environment for generations to come. We're also looking at programs for recycling in apartment complexes to keep more trash out of our landfills. And the Department of Public Utilities will begin upgrading outdated meters for all water, sewer, and city power customers this year laying the foundation for future customer benefits, including earlier water leak detection and monthly instead of quarterly billing. All of these steps will move us closer to an equitable and sustainable city. Digital inclusion is also imperative to the equity of our city. We saw the dramatic impact that lack of internet connectivity had to our most vulnerable families because of the pandemic. They were simply left behind. That cannot continue. That's why the City of Columbus and Smart Columbus are partnering with the Columbus Foundation, Franklin County, the Columbus Metropolitan Library, Columbus Public Schools, Morpsey, and others to sponsor 700 Southside and King Lincoln households to get connected with free, high-quality, in-home Wi-Fi service, primarily for the purpose of distance learning. When this initiative concludes at the end of this year, we will use what we've learned to provide more Columbus residents with affordable in-home internet access so everyone can access education, healthcare, and job opportunities online. Closing the digital divide is part of our equity agenda. It's also one way that Smart Columbus will pivot building off the success of the last four years and continuing to convene public and private sector leaders to innovate, collaborate, and solve some of the most pressing challenges facing our community. Our city was not only impacted by the pandemic last year, a reckoning for racial justice was also brought to a head with the murder of George Floyd. Make no mistake, issues of racial justice and a call to address police brutality have existed for decades, but the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Andre Hill, Casey Goodson, and so many others at the hands of law enforcement increase the urgency for police reform. We have responded with reforms that will begin to transform policing. I issued an executive order to require the independent investigation of all fatal use of force cases or cases of death in police custody by the Ohio Attorney General's Bureau of Criminal Investigation. The Division of Police changed its use of force in response to nonviolent protests, and I enacted Andre's law to ensure the proper care is provided to anyone injured by law enforcement. 
I put forth a ballot initiative to amend the Columbus City Charter and to establish a civilian police review board and an inspector general for the Division of Police. Issue 2 passed last November with overwhelming support of voters. And just days ago, I advanced my appointments for the first ever civilian review board. That's just the start. We're in the process of hiring a new police chief from outside the division, a transformational leader with experience creating culture change. We're seating the most diverse class of police recruits in recent memory in June. We're continuing to implement the recommendations of the Columbus Safety Advisory Commission and the independent consulting firm Matrix, who reviewed policies, procedures, hiring practices, and training of the Columbus Division of Police. And we're laying the groundwork for alternative crisis response that will send the right response at the right time to our neighbors in need. We will hire 20 social workers to be integrated into the emergency call system to respond to people in crisis due to mental health issues or addiction. The changes we're making now will build stronger police community relations. Police reform, ensuring our residents feel safe wherever they go, including their interactions with police. That is part of our equity agenda. Part of our resiliency moving forward will come from the continued creation of jobs, good paying careers that can support a family. Before the pandemic, we were poised to continue a positive trajectory of job growth, and we have every reason to believe that will continue. This summer, we'll start our first cohort of the Building Back Better Together program for people entering the trades. In June, 20 participants will begin an eight-week employment and training program to provide training and certifications that can be translated into career opportunities in the trades. Participants will be paid a weekly stipend, given the necessary tools and equipment, and referred for opportunities after graduation. We expect to seat a second cohort in the fall. As construction of housing and businesses continues, trade workers remain in high demand. We are continuing outreach to underrepresented populations in our community to drive an interest in the trades, which are solid career jobs with great benefits. Connecting residents to good paying careers in the trades, that is part of our equity agenda. I'm also very excited about the Columbus Innovation District we announced just a few weeks ago with Jobs Ohio, the Ohio State University, and Nationwide Children's Hospital. The district aims to generate 20,000 new jobs in Central Ohio over the next 10 years, involving an estimated 10,000 direct STEM jobs in the technology and healthcare industries as well as 10,000 indirect jobs in the community at large. And with that, we'll be able to develop the West Campus area into a mixed income neighborhood, along with multimodal transportation options along the Northwest Corridor. All of that translates into continued resiliency in the job market in the coming years. We're also taking additional steps to ensure that the resiliency we build is equitable. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion has been at the forefront of this work, completing the first disparity study in the city since 1993, and now implementing the recommendations the study provided. Making minority participation part of development agreements assures that minority companies are able to be part of the development of our city. We have almost doubled our minority spend as a city since 2015. One example is the new downtown crew soccer stadium, which included a 30% minority participation goal. The stadium is set to open in July, which is very exciting. But from my point of view, meeting the historic goal of minority participation, $74 million in contracts, is an even bigger win for the community. Creating more opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses to have equal access to city contracts that is part of our equity agenda. Thanks to the creative leadership of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we're also looking at ways to increase diversity, not only of all employees, but also executive staff and boards and commissions. Minorities make up about 30% of our population in Columbus. So it's only fitting that employees, C-suites, and boardrooms reflect that diversity. Through the 30 by 30 plan, 
the city is looking at the diversity of our own employees, managers and boards, and we're asking all Columbus employers to do the same. Last year's State of the City address, I declared racism a public health crisis and tasked our health commissioner, Dr. Mashika Roberts, with providing recommendations on how to best address it. She launched the Center for Public Health Innovation, and at the end of last year, she sent me recommendations we are instituting. We will be implementing a scorecard on our equity projects because, as I've said many times, if you don't measure it, you don't mean it. To assure our initiatives are working, we'll be measuring the data and sharing results with the community. We've also joined the Equity Now Coalition, a social justice initiative started by the Columbus Urban League and other community partners focused on equitable outcomes for black Columbus. We've invested $160,000 into those efforts, and we are contributing $2.9 million in direct financial support to at-risk expectant mothers through the Healthy Beginnings at Home program, part of Celebrate One. Additional funds allow us to support rental assistance and other services for mothers-to-be, helping to reduce infant mortality. The Columbus Women's Commission has been busy addressing gender issues in the midst of the pandemic, including a key court win regarding evictions. Last year, in conjunction with the Legal Aid Society of Columbus, landlords are now required to show up and testify in court for an eviction. We're seeing more situations where landlords and tenants come to agreements or rent repayment or amicable move-outs without formal evictions which make it more difficult for tenants to find affordable housing, a phenomenon that disproportionately impacts black women. In addition, a few weeks ago, Columbus was selected to receive more than two years of funding and technical support from the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund. Columbus will be able to bring free, professional, one-on-one -on -one financial counseling to residents, particularly as they deal with the financial impacts of COVID-19 another important step in building resiliency into our community. Recover, rebuild, resiliency. After this turbulent year, we have to look at unity. How are we going to move forward together? For that answer, I gathered community members at the new Linden Community Center for a conversation about our next steps. It's nearly impossible to look forward to 2021 without spending some time reflecting on 2020. What was last year like for you and those around you? Last year was, I think, difficult for all of us, be it personally and professionally. And I think we were all trying to figure out how to navigate this new world of COVID. What I'm grateful for is I think the city, this community is resilient. And because of hope, because of resilience, we're able to figure it out. We're able to have these difficult, hard, challenging conversations with each other and try to, to grow as individuals and as people. And that's what gives me so much hope, not just through 2020, but for the future. The state, the city, and the county came together. At, at, at the beginning, all you guys were just clicking, talking about the same things, getting the same information. And I thought that was great. We're an essential operation, so we knew we had to stay open because to serve our clients. And we got the information from the city, from the Columbus Public Health Department, CDC and all, and was able to go forward. So that part was very inspiring for me, but it did point out that, that uh, divisiveness that's here in this country. And a lot of us said, we're gonna do something about that. And I just think that that was the, the ray of sunshine or hope or however you wanna call that, that, that came from this. These inequities didn't happen overnight. How did we get here? Well, it's hard growing up as a young black person here in America. Like I can't walk into a store without someone looking at me weird. Like one time I walked into this gas station the worker was following me around thinking that I might steal something. It's hard for you to feel like somebody thinks of you that way, that they can't trust you. And I feel like education, along with coming together, is one step to make our community more safe for black Americans and for the rest of the world. One of the most interesting and hopeful things about um, all of the protests that took place this past summer is that they, they weren't church-led 
and they weren't being led by, frankly, anyone over 25 years old. My generation, I feel like we haven't gone through um, the civil rights movement, so I think that we were kind of complacent in mm. what this pandemic did, for me at least, um, because I was out on the front line, it put this fire up under my butt to really do the work and not lose momentum. And I hope that we continue this momentum in the days and years to come. I've thought for a long time that what is that moment that defines our generation? Um, when I was growing up, there was the Iraq war and then the war on terrorism, but that was always out there. And unless you were from a military family, that didn't really affect you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what is that? World War I, World War II, uh, the, the, the movement in the 60s, the civil rights movement. This is our moment. How can we as America's opportunity city move to a prosperous future for every resident that builds back better together than we were before the pandemic hit. We belong to each other in this really clear way. Um, at the same time, we felt the pang, the loss of being separated physically from one another. Mm -hmm. All of these things are interconnected and the health and well-being of one part of the city is connected to the health and well-being of another part, we will only be able to tackle these systemic issues if we remember that interconnectedness. Mm. Not that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. We're not. And in fact, that's one of the best parts of Columbus. But at the same time, we are interconnected and we belong to one another. Mm. For me, I saw, you know, grocery workers, those jobs that we took for granted, how impactful they are, not just through a pandemic, but now that we're in this new space, I wanna see us honoring our mm. pharmacists, our frontline workers in a way. Our custodians. Absolutely, and, and celebrate them. Um, even when we go back to opening our doors mm -hmm. to remember the humanity of, of those individuals and, and never go backwards. I don't wanna go back to normal. I, I wanna honor the half million plus people that lost their lives over this past year. I wanna honor George Floyd and his family and, and Breonna Taylor and, and so many others. And this is hard work, right? But we need to stick with it. We can't have a short attention span. We need to stay focused on this and not go back to normal because if we can figure this out, there's so much opportunity. But we have to address these systemic challenges that have been with us longer than any of us have been alive. I think with the generation that we have now, especially with the youth that I'm part of, Columbus will be a very unique place because every youth brings something different to the table. Someone might bring ideas about beauty standards, another person might bring an idea about religion, school, racism. And I feel like if we all stay open-minded to these ideas and forget things that we've been taught whether it's about racism that's been embedded in our family, families for generations, we'd have a chance to expand our wings as Columbus and also in hopes of spreading them to other parts of Ohio and maybe even the rest of the country. If we stay open-minded and aware and educated of all these topics, that the future of Columbus will really be out there and bright. Thanks to each and every one of you and look forward to working with you together. It was a powerful discussion. I invite you to listen to it in its entirety on the city's YouTube page. Pulitzer Prize winning author John Beecham, who has documented a great deal of presidential history, wrote, in our finest hours, though the soul of the country manifests itself in an inclination to open our arms rather than to clench our fists, to look out rather than to turn inward, to accept, rather than reject. In so doing, America has grown ever stronger, confident that the choice of light over dark is the means by which we pursue progress. Neighbors, that is where we are today. The pendulum of time is starting to swing from pain and division to solace and unity. The Columbus comeback, rooted in equity, shared prosperity, dynamic and inclusive growth. At this time next year, we will be a better city than we are today and on our way to being the best city 
we have ever been. God bless you and God bless the city of Columbus. Good night.